right welcome to a different corner in my home i thought that this would be a nice change of background of scenery a nice change of scenery we are diving in to chapter one in the study on the book of jonah by darlene schacht and this is available at amazon.com if you want to purchase that purchase it let's not say purchase us if you want to purchase it and join us for this study we would absolutely love it and if you cannot afford to purchase it we do want it available for everybody so if you go to timewarpwife.com all of darlene schacht's Bible studies are available there for free download along with her blog and many other resources that you can enjoy. Before diving in, I just want to give a little preface that all of my thoughts that I share in this study and in any study that I do, they are just my own thoughts. That's what they are. And I really, really hope that you guys are studying the word of God for yourself so that you can discern the truth when you are listening to somebody like me. I know that um, I am not perfect. I do not have perfect theology yet. And so I really want you guys also to be in the word yourself and to be discerning with the things that I say and um, being firm in the truth of the word because that is our foundation for everything. So all of that being said, before I actually start the study and the notes that I wanted to share here, I'm going to read the chapter itself because there's no better way to start. So Jonah chapter one, here we go. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down, that is so hard to say, Tarshish, Tarshish, oh goodness. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for the port, for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish and to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that, this, that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? For they knew he had been running from the he was running away from the Lord because he had told them already. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that the great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. It's amazing to me how much of the story is in the first chapter. I feel like this is what we're always told, you know, as children and as growing up, this is the part of the story that we actually are familiar with. The next three chapters reveal a lot about Jonah and his perspective and about repentance and obedience and about God's heart towards people. It is amazing. But I'm going to stop there. We're going to read chapter two next week before we get into the notes. But I just wanted to jump into the study now. A few things that, that Darlene said that I thought were so good. And uh, I'm going to start on page nine here. If you're encountering Jonah's story for the first time, you might think that he ran out of fear. However, we learn in chapter four, Jonah's fight was less about fear and more about a stubborn blend of pride and prejudice. He knew God's character merciful and for he knew god's character merciful and forgiving and he didn't want his enemies the ninevites to receive such grace and this you know as a christian now looking back having known the story like you know we're looking at it from hindsight it's so easy to judge jonah 
for being disobedient. And I mean, come on, he heard the voice of God. Like it was so clear. Why would he risk disobeying God? He knows what happens when you disobey God, I'm guessing. And yet he did. And so there was something very strong behind that. And there may have been fear because he was going into what actually, um, Mar Darlene, I'm good. I'm so sorry. I was going to call you Marlene. <clears throat> And actually what Darlene shared before that Nineveh was the capital of the ancient Assyrian empire, which the Bible often portrays as a great enemy of Israel and is also known for its wickedness. It sets that backdrop for Jonah's hesitation. This is a very dangerous place. He should have been expecting that he could be killed going into this, going into this city, which already is like, I would be making excuses not to go. But beyond that, I was listening to a commentary about the book of Jonah and somebody compared it to a Jew walking into Germany during World War II and trying to save their souls and share the gospel with them. It's like how much of your flesh should be going, no, I want them to get the punishment that God has been saying he's going to give because I've seen and I've experienced the pain of their wickedness on my people. So then that gives you, you can kind of feel that hesitantness that he has and that even that pain that he's experienced from the Ninevites himself, possibly towards his own country, towards his own people. And so, yeah, that definitely gives a bit of a broader perspective. Page 10 here, she writes, the Bible often reminds us that the sin, that sin has a cost both seen and unseen. That is absolutely true. This fare that Jonah paid to get onto the ship to go to Tarshish was his immediate payment, but the storm that ensued shows that the ultimate price of disobedience can be much higher. This subtle yet powerful powerful detail enriches the narrative gently. Okay, I'm gonna start that over. This subtle yet powerful detail enriches the narrative gently reminding us how our choices can impact our relationship with God and lead to consequences far beyond what we might initially imagine. And it's amazing because God is so gracious. Like in his word, he has given us very clear boundaries and told us how he wants us to live. And if he's the one that created life, he absolutely has the right and should be the one to tell us how to live because he knows best. He created this whole system to work according to his plan and he knows how it's supposed to work. He knows how it's supposed to function best. And then we get mad at him for, you know, giving us these rules and regulations and these boundaries. And yet he's just saying, Hey, if you don't listen to them, like the consequences of your actions are going to be great. And he is so gracious to give us that warning. Further down the page, she says, whether good or bad, the actions that we take affect others. Absolutely. As much as we might, might like to think that our sin is our personal business, it has the potential to cause a ripple effect in our lives. The effect of our sin reaches out further than we could imagine, destroying families, breaking up friendships, and splitting up churches. But sweet friend, here's the hopeful message nestled in Jonah's story. In the midst of the storm, God's love was inescapable and unchanging. That's absolutely true. At the bottom of the page there it says our lives are filled with triumphs and trials and some days we wonder why life is so hard throughout the bible we see god using tribulation to draw his people back to their faith here are just a few examples and she gave lots of really good ones and you know it's so interesting how we can get angry at God for sending us the consequences of our sin and really it's grace, you know? And sometimes I've heard people say that God does not use pain to bring us back to him, but oh my goodness, the story in the Old Testament, like over and over again, he wants to bless his people. That's what he wants. He wants to bring them into the promised land. He wants to bless their nation. And then as soon as they have blessing and they get settled, they turn inward, they get prideful, they start depending upon themselves and being sufficient on their own and not glorifying God and turning to other gods. And then he removes his hand of blessing. And all of a sudden in their, in their downfall, they want God again and they turn to God again. And it's so interesting that it's just our sin nature to get comfortable in our own security and forget how much we need God. And 
Their lane continues here at the bottom of page 12. The good news in all of this is that the Lord is never far from the brokenhearted. Their hardships was part of a much greater plan that would move them to repentance. Emphasis on repentance and draw them closer to God. The Bible tells us there is a purpose for our pain and that refines us, molds us, and ultimately strengthens our faith. And that is so true. With that, oh, here, with, yes, sorry, a little bit. With that, I'm reminded of the powerful words of Corey Ten Boom. Even just thinking of her makes me want to cry. <laughs> you may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And sometimes, you know, I have prayed to God, like, do whatever it takes to shake me. Like, I don't want to be the sleeping Christian, unprepared for the return of my king, or unprepared to suffer for him one day. And um, that is a hard prayer to pray because, man, I have little children and I definitely want them to enjoy their childhood and to grow up in the blessings that I grew up in. And yet I can totally see how self-dependent I am. You know, whether it's just because I have my job security and my bank account and I have a vehicle and a home and a husband and family and a church. And it all just makes me feel so secure and so safe. And even during COVID, it's like that was shaken up and taken away a little bit. And so... Um, it's hard to pray those prayers because you want your children and your family to be comfortable and to live in the, in, in the security that I've grown up in. And yet looking at life from an eternal perspective, it would be far more worth it to suffer this entire lifetime and depend on Christ and actually be awake you know, not sleeping as a Christian, but awake and depending on him and really trusting in him. It's interesting how even during COVID, I think that's what I was saying, you know, life was shaken. Our normal was taken away. And how many people just got flown into chaos and we realized all the things we find security in are definitely temporary, are definitely not actually reliable. And we want to have control so badly. We're like holding on so tight. And it's in that grip that we're actually losing our peace and losing the comfort. If we finally let go of our life and say, God, whatever comes, whether it's torment and suffering or a blessing, I will follow you. And I know that you'll be close to the brokenhearted. And I know that you are going to be there with me. And letting go of that, oh my goodness, the peace that can come. And I mean, it's not easy. Oh my goodness, my flesh and my anxiety fights that every time I want to pray that prayer. Lord, do whatever it takes to get my heart, to get my attention, to get my trust. That is a scary prayer. That is a scary prayer to pray. And yet I want that more. And so... Oh my goodness. There are times where I go to pray it and I hesitate and I'm like, oh Lord, grow my faith. Grow my faith. I'm in it with you guys. And it's so interesting. Our culture is so bound up in comfort and pleasure. And I read a quote the other day, and this is a little bit off topic, but I just found it so interesting. Someone said, and quoting their grandfather, um, I'll never forget what my grandfather said. My life was tiring for the body, but it was comfortable for the soul. Your life is comfortable for the body, but it is tiring for the soul. And isn't that so true? We have made a, a trade there where we have so much. I even look at myself now having babies. There are so many resources and so many little things that I have that my mom did not have when she had babies, like a wipes warmer. <laughs> Literally, so I can just like wipe my baby's bum at night and not wake them up with cold wipes or pajamas that open from a zipper from the bottom to the top so I don't have to completely undress them. Like there's so many things. I can think of a million things that are at my fingertips that make having a newborn baby so much more convenient. And yet we really have made a trade there where we have so much, but now our soul, it's like we're moving at such a fast pace in life now and we make ourselves so busy and we have so much to take care of because we have so much that there's no peace. There's no rest for our soul. There's no time to meditate on the things we're thankful for. As soon as one little thing goes wrong in our day, it throws us for a complete chaotic 
loop. <laughs> it throws us off because we're so used to everything moving at such a fast pace, so effortlessly and perfectly. And then if one little thing goes wrong, it's just like absolute anxiety and chaos. And man, like I almost wish I was part of the generation that had to work tirelessly, but their souls had rest. And it's just such an interesting perspective. Moving on here, she says, remember our pain and our trials are not purposeless. They serve to refine us, strengthen our faith and deepen our relationship with God. And I'll just put my own little thought out there and say, the only time that our pain in life will ever be wasted is if we don't turn towards God in trust and repentance. And uh, it's so easy, even when somebody else is causing us pain, like for instance, in marriage, like if there's adultery or if there's even small things where your partner is the one that's hurting you, it's so easy to get so bound up in blaming that person and praying for that person and hoping for that person to change that in that pain, we don't turn to God and say, is there anything you want me to change? Is there any attitude that I've been doing? Have I been, have I been a part of this in any way? What is my heart? How can I be a good wife? And it's amazing how I think sometimes the trials would wrap up sooner if we would just learn our lesson <laughs> and repent sooner. Uh, yeah, I think we cause ourselves a lot more pain by not repenting, by not being humble, and by pointing the finger at God or at other people instead of actually considering maybe this is here to refine me. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the study there, but she asked a question and I thought I might as well share a story while I'm here. And she asked, can you recall a time in your own life when you sensed God's clear intervention? What unfolded and how did that experience reshape your path or perspective? So I thought I'd share this story and this is definitely a unique story. These experiences do not happen every day in my life, but there was a season I was 21 years old and single, living at home with my parents, and I had actually just come back from doing school abroad, Bible school abroad, and then I was actually gonna be doing another school at my church part-time, it was like two days a week, and so I was looking for a part-time job. And I had a seasonal one for the summer, but I needed something starting in September, and school was starting soon. I remember it being the end of August, and I'm a planner. I like to have a plan and to think ahead and be prepared. And I really sensed that God wanted me to wait in the job applying process. And I was ready to apply anywhere to get a job. And I really just, I, I don't know what it was. It was just this feeling of, I need to, I need to wait. God has something for me. And so that does not happen every day, but I was like, okay, I, I will wait and see. There's no harm in it at this in this situation. So I did wait. And then one day, nearing the end of August, I remember I was sitting on my bed and I really sensed that it was time to pray for this job. And so I said, Lord, any job, I will take any job. Please provide a job for me or help me to find the right one. And I felt like I should just write out what would be my dream job in that moment? What would be the job that I, if, if I could pick any job, what job would I pick? And so I remember telling God, if I can put my order in, <laughs> this is the job that I would love. And I, I love taking care of people. And so I said, if it could be a job where I'm taking care of people and being able to spend time with people, but I also love children, like love children. And so maybe being a nanny or working in a daycare, I don't know, but something either taking care of elderly people or, or children or something like that, Lord, whatever, whatever it is, um, that would be amazing, but I'll take anything. And I, I got up off my bed and I grabbed my phone that was on my desk and I checked my text messages and I, lo and behold, had a text message from a woman at my church and I knew her family and she was offering me a job as home care for her daughter that had a medical condition. Her daughter was younger than school age at the time and uh, needed lots of care. It was the perfect amount of hours. It was good pay. It was exactly what I was asking for. And then I also got to help take care of her, kind of be like a nanny for her older three, which was just so much fun. And I loved that job. It felt like it was handpicked for me. And that moment 
blew my mind. It literally was like, I asked, I described, and I was given. Like it was, it was instantaneous answer to prayer. And it was clearly the hand of God, just, you know, guiding me, telling me to wait, and then providing a job that was beyond what I could have asked for. And that does not always happen. Sometimes we are called to do the jobs we don't want to do, and that grows our character so much. But this time the Lord blessed me with a job that I just treasured. And it's so interesting looking back because after that job, I had the courage to actually go to school, get my healthcare aid um, certificate and work in healthcare. And I don't think I would have had the confidence to do that had I not had the experiences of that job. And now that I'm working in healthcare, I'm starting to wonder, maybe I'll actually one day apply for school and go for my licensed practical nursing, who knows? But God's hand was clearly there and it's so interesting to see how he guides our path. And so that's that's just one story in my life where God definitely um, was guiding my life and a moment that I'm also very grateful for. So anyways, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for joining me. And please, even in the comments, if you're not already joining our Facebook group, please join it. It's If you go on Facebook and search Bible Studies by Time Warp Wife, you can ask to join our group and please join in the comments there. Share your own testimony, a story where God intervened in your life or share your thoughts and comments about what you thought in this chapter of the study or the first chapter in the book of Jonah, what stood out to you, what was challenging to you, what was convicting to you and how are you applying this chapter to your life now? So thank you guys so much for joining us. I've had so much fun with you guys and all the previous studies and I am so blessed and privileged to be here with you again. So thank you guys for joining us. And until next week, I will see you again. Bye for now.